Right, let's get started with solving the capacitance problem using console multiphysics. So, here we are with the console desktop. Uh, when we switch on uh, console, that's the first menu that we see. And here we can choose between setting up a blank model or using this model wizard. So I go for the model wizard, selecting 2D uh, space and electrostatic simulation. And then we go here and this is our this uh, select study option that allows us to choose between different formulation of the equation. So in our case, since nothing is really dependent on time or uh, frequency, so it's okay that we just choose a stationary uh, formulation. We press done. Uh, okay, the, the reason for setting up this I wizard is that we would like to have certain presets ready for us to get started. And obviously we don't have to do that, we have the option to choose the physics interface later on. So if we'd like to change this electrostatic interface, we can go here and add physics and choose different ones. And so the same thing applies to the study interface, so we can change or add more of the formulations here. Instead of stationary, that could for example be the frequency domain or time dependent, but here we just work with the stationary. So. Now I'm going to show you the basic process, the workflow for making a computer simulation using console. So the problem number one, the task number one, is to start parameterizing the model. So generally you don't need to parameterize it, but it's strongly advised that you do so because that simply speeds up your work later on. So uh, let's assume that we would like to parameterize these four circles from, uh, from the last video. And for, to do that, I, uh, we press here and uh, we need to uh, first add the global parameters. So let's assume that uh, we parameterize the radius of the circles as R1. Let's say that will be equal to 1. R2, let's say that will be equal to half. R3, let's say that will be equal to 0.3 multiplied by R1. So we can actually use the uh, one parameter and express it in terms of the other. And let's say R4 will be equal to pi over 4. So it's all, uh, this wizard also accepts the um, mathematical formulations. So, all right, we have these four. So step number two is we need to set up the geometry. So we go here and by pressing the right button on the mouse, uh, we can open this uh, menu or we can just go here in the top ribbon and we have the exact same options. So let's just pick quickly a few circles and start. One, two, three, and four. And since we have defined these parameters before, we can use them to help us defining uh, the geometry. So let's say the radius of the first one is R1, radius of the second one is R2, radius of the third one is R3, and radius of the fourth is R4. If we press here, build our objects, that's our updating the entire geometry of the model. And well, uh, we have located the circles uh, the way that they overlap, so let's just quickly uh, move them uh, to different locations such that we don't have the overlap. And now we have these four circles. Uh, last thing that we need to do is to account for this uh, frame of reference. So if I just pull up the rectangle from the top menu, then I can surround the circles here. Because in finite element method, we need to account for the entire volume. And uh, it's not only that the circles we need to, we need to put, but we also need to uh, put a certain frame, um, a certain boundary for the overall model. And generally that might actually be uh, a task in itself, because if we, um, if we encapsulate you know, too large space into our model, then we are on one hand getting closer and closer to the re reality. On the other hand, uh, that's going to take uh, the computer to solve it, uh, and it will take a longer time. And on the other hand, if we, uh, for example, put the boundary too close to the objects, that we might actually uh, get the re uh, results being influenced by the presence of this model, which is not present in the reality. So that obviously will be wrong. So that could be a task in itself to figure out where we actually should put this boundary. But here, let's say we don't have this problem. We have a predefined geometry, and that's going to be the ground anyway. So that's uh, how we set up the geometry. So once again, let's say press build all, we have updated it.
Uh, then the next task is that as soon as we've got the geometry ready, we would like to proceed with choosing the materials. And in version 5.1 or 5.2, uh, you have this possibility to uh, choose the material links. So the way to start is that we go here and choose the blank material. And from the material properties, we go to basic properties. And here we choose the relative permittivity because that's the only one that we need. And here we already get the warning because we haven't specified any value for the relative or permittivity. So we can just fix it to a number or we can put the matrix of numbers if we like to, uh, you know, um, account for the anisotropy. Or again, we could put our, uh, we could put the symbol. So it's, let's say epsilon one. And if I go up, uh, now it shows the warning because console isn't sure if this value is uh, defined uh, beforehand and we know that it isn't so we're going to add it here and let's initialize it as one so if we go back to the material we see now it changed the color so the console recognizes that then we go here to the materials and we need to uh, assign the materials to our geometry and we do that by choosing this material link which is a very nice feature because uh, assuming that let's say we've got 100 different materials and we'd like to uh, swap different objects uh, and swap the materials, assign them to a different objects and so on. We can just, you know, change these materials. And here by default, uh, it's the entire modeling space that is going to be assigned exactly the same uh, dielectric constant. So let's just leave it like that. So we have the parameters, we have the geometry and we have the materials. So what's next is uh, the boundary conditions. So by using this wizard, we have our preset our physics interface to be the electrostatic interface and uh, if we um, right click again uh, we, we have a number of different boundary conditions we can also select them here from physics and uh, if we for example press here we can choose the ground so now if this uh, switch is active uh, we can go around and select the boundaries and include them to uh, represent the entire um, represent one boundary collectively so here these four segments are going to be assigned to be uh, the circuit ground and as you, as you can see here, uh, the electric potential is going to be set to zero. So that's the definition of the ground. Uh, later on, uh, we would like to uh, account for these four circles to, be the, uh, to act as independent terminals. So uh, we choose terminal. And when we choose the terminal, uh, again, we need to add the boundary to, um, uh, we need to bind the geometry with the boundary. So here we have a different, formula, uh, different formulations possible. If we, for example, uh, would like to decide of how much charge they would, uh, we, they would like to be assigned to, then we have this um, formula to help us to understand what's going on. So in this case, any boundary that we're going to select uh, is going to be expressed uh, as uh, taking the normal component of the electric displacement field, integrated that over the entire boundary and set to a constant number that we can decide upon. But as you remember, uh, we're going to uh, work with voltages. So uh, we'd like the solver to uh, set one volt to one electrode at a time, uh, leaving all the rest at zero. So let's change the formulation to voltage. And now we see that voltage will be set to a particular voltage, uh, V0. And if this is active, let's start setting up the first boundary. And as you can see here, I don't necessarily care which uh, of these electrodes is one, which, is, which one of them is named two and so on. But normally that's something you should be careful with. So I'm, I have selected uh, the first circle and that's going to be represented by terminal number one. And the terminal name is one. Um, now, uh, if we have uh, certain settings here, we can uh, right click and duplicate uh, uh, this boundary. So in this way, we already have the same presets and, and the only thing which is updated now is the ter terminal name. But we need to change the selection. So if we clear the selection, uh, we can use this box and set up the second circle to be uh, the electrode number two. And we repeat that uh, two more times, clear this one and set up the third one and the last one. Okay, so now we have the four electrodes selected and we do have the ground as well. 
Uh, one thing before moving on, uh, as you remember, uh, the capacitance extraction problem assumed that we put one volt to one electrode at the time, but leaving all the other ones at zero. And if you look carefully enough here, uh, you actually see that we assign one volt to all of them. So we will not be obviously able to extract any capacitance if we set all the voltages equal to one here, uh, simply because there's not going to be any potential difference between the objects. So no charge will be induced mutually uh, if we set it like that. So we need to find a way to overwrite this uh, condition. And we do that by going back to the electrostatic node and here go down and if you see there is this terminal sweep setting. So if we press activate terminal sweep, uh, then we have uh, a new variable here, which is called port name. And if we now assign it to one of the uh, global parameters, which means it will be seen from anywhere within the model. So if we press port one and initialize it to one, uh, then we can use console settings to uh, sweep, uh, uh, sweep this uh, port name variable one, two, three, and four, and that will overwrite these conditions uh, with the voltages here. So it's going to be assigned one volt uh, per each electrode one at the time. And then we need to tell console one more thing. So if we go here to study node, uh, we right click and we choose the parameter sweep. And we need to do that in order to actually tell explicitly uh, that uh, we have one more variable and we'd like to define a for loop and sweep this variable. So if we go here, we select the parameter. Now, we can actually choose a different parameter as well. We can define a double for loop, uh, but now we uh, just go for the port name. And here we can just specify the list of one, two, three, and four comma separated integers. Or we can press here and define this, uh, the range as starting from one with a step of one and stopping at four. So we replace that expression. This is exactly the same thing. So the last thing that we need to do, and so far we have parameterized the model, set up the geometry, set up the materials, and assigned the boundary conditions. So uh, the next step is the mesh. And the mesh is actually, uh, this is sort of an art in itself, because this is a concept that is very tightly related to finite element method analysis. And uh, as the name suggests, uh, the solver is going to uh, divide the, the entire geometry into uh, a set of finite elements and now depending on the size of these elements uh, it's going to be the simulation is either going to favor a more pre precise result because if we put the denser and denser mesh on that then it means that our system is uh, going to represent uh, the reality closer and closer and closer but at the same time creating more degrees of freedom is going to take the solver longer time to compute on the other hand if we select the mesh that is too sparse and uh, then perhaps the simulation time will not be uh, too high, but on the other hand, we might uh, really get uh, strange uh, errors, or at least our result will be something of a really orientational quality. So I would recommend that we would do the first round uh, just briefly uh, defining a very sparse mesh, and then uh, once seeing it working, we can increase the mesh density. But here we, let's, uh, let's just create a fine uh, mesh, we just, if you see, okay, fine, if we selected uh, less density or higher density, then you see what happens. But let's just stay with our uh, fine. Normally, uh, I would say that uh, for the triangular mesh, uh, probably the best results you get are with the fine anyway, because if you, if you start increasing the mesh density, uh, you will get a higher and higher precision but the time uh, to compute might actually go exponentially, so I would, uh, I would be a bit conservative here. So we have the parameters, geometry, materials, boundary conditions, and mesh. So build all, yes, we do have the mesh. So the next thing now we are ready to solve. So if we go to the study and press compute, uh, we will start solving this model. And as you can see here in the log, it is actually sweeping uh, the parameter called port name from one to four. Uh, this is a very good thing. And now the appearance of this plot is a very nice thing. It means that the, uh, the model has computed successfully. And if we, for example, go here and uh, choose different uh, uh, port value, so let's say change that to one, you see that now the electrode number one 
it's being given one volt potential when you're looking at the electric potential plot and all the rest of them are set to zero and if we change to two we update now this one is set to one so the last task before we finish is that we'd like to um, we'd like to extract the capacitances so we have now our Poisson equation being solved. We know the electric potential, we know the charges, and we know the dielectric constant. So we should be able to extract the capacitance from these data. If you look here, the data set to which this plot is assigned is called data set 2, and it refers to this parametric solution. So if we went here, we wouldn't have the sweep. So we need to go here, and we now know that uh, this is this parameter, uh, parametric solution. So now in order to move to capacitance, we go to the, per to the results and uh, right click and select our matrix uh, element, uh, sorry, uh, global matrix evaluation, that's how it's called. So now we do change this data set to the parametric as well. Um, the range of the sweep parameters is all of them, so from one to four. And by replacing expression, we are able to navigate uh, how the capacitance is being named by console. So if we select that, uh, uh, we choose capacitance. And a very interesting convention of console, by the way, is that whenever we refer to a variable that has been computed by console, we're going to have the symbol of it and the prefix that refers to the particular physics interface. So in case we have more than one, then this is how we can find the relevant uh, variable. So if we now change the unit, uh, we can choose the menu or we can just say let's say PF, that stands for picofarad, and by pressing here evaluate, uh, we get the capacitance matrix. So as you recall from, uh, uh, from the last video, uh, you notice now that all the self-capacitance are numbers, are, are positive numbers, and all the mutual terms are negative numbers. So this is nothing wrong, but I, when working with the desktop, we have a, a little bit limited options when it comes to performing some additional tasks and there are ways to go around it but they are rather complicated so in the name in the next video uh, in the next video I would like to show you how uh, we can uh, take advantage of some programming and help us to solve the, these kind of problems